symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. The winner of this cup and new World Wrestling Federation heavyweight champion. He's now going to come out to leg one, two, he's got a... You do not throw rocks at a man who's got a machine gun. Savage, the cream of the crop. Nobody does it better. We got a big battle in front of us, baby. So let's get fucking like a monkey. To be the man, you gotta beat the man. Woo! Talk about your songs. Talk about John 316. Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass. We got two words for you. I'm breaking the fourth wall. Because the champ is here. Rest in peace. Yeah! This is the Pro Wrestling Show with your host, Paulie Flight. Welcome to another edition of The Wrestling Show. Yours truly, Polly Lights, in here with a special guest, a couple of special guests. We have one of the funnest tag teams I have ever seen wrestle. You guys are fun. We got Brian Nobbs, Jerry Sags, the Nasty Boys. Hey, you guys are fun. Nastiest. Nastiest, too. Yep, that's right. Doing the nasty. It was, it was so fun. Thanks for having us, man. appreciate it. Absolutely. I mean, it, it was so much fun watching you guys. And... Uh, uh, my partner Ben was going to be here, but he had to go. He does the morning show, so he uh, had to jet, jet out early. But one question he did want me to ask you: He ain't nasty. He, he would have stuck around. Well, that's around. true. That's Come true. On. I've been up since that's, nine o'clock last that's night. That's right. Yeah. 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 So he. Him, he's getting Pity City. Yes, yeah. and that was the question uh, he wanted me to ask: How did you come up with Pity City? That's a that's a good one because. That goes back when you were just talking about your uh, your programming director out mm-hmm. with the you know he when he said he saw us wrestle the Rockers back in the day yeah. in Midgey, you know what I mean? Uh, back when me and Nas broke in in the AWA with Vern mm-hmm. Gagne, went through Vern Gagne's training camp taught by Brad Reagan's um, uh, guys came, you know off, off the big. 80s, early 80s, one, two, and three WrestleMania runs sure. were, were main ones that we got to meet and, and be around a lot. Was Adrian Adonis, uh, um, Jimmy Schnuka, mm-hmm. and uh, Cowboy Bob Orton. Right. Because you know, we got sent to pick them up and drive them around, and Jimmy and Schnuka ended up staying over with us and that kind of stuff. But uh, later on, we met Roddy Piper and. But Adrian Adonis was one of the first guys. We were at a TV, I think in Minot it was, and he saw us the first time wrestling. We came back, and what we goes, we came back into the dressing room. Was well, you're you're calling yourselves the Nasty Boys. What what? I didn't see what what's nasty. I go, he goes, he goes. Well, I didn't see nothing. What I didn't see you pull a pin out of your pocket and stab somebody in the eyeball with it. <laughs> Did you spit in somebody's face? Did you, you know, take their, somebody's head and rub it in their? Your their your armpit and we we're like think that oh my god you know that's probably the first time we heard it and uh, you know you know what he's right you know right. we should do more and that that and we we did the spitting also sure. and that used to drive Gorilla Monsoon nuts oh I bet on WWE because back then you couldn't even you couldn't touch a chair table go outside the ramp nothing we used to walk out and spit and think what and you got Gorilla go what are you doing spitting under the wall well, we're nasty boys you know but that's sort of where it came. From my little mobs will tell you another story about Roddy because he did sort of the same thing because them guys were truly masters and experts at really knowing how to develop and bring across what's really you. Sure. And Roddy was a genius at that. That was Adrian Adonis. But now, what did Roddy say to you about that? Oh, Roddy was, uh, you know, just saying, hey, you know, when we told him what Adrian said, and uh, Adrian and Roddy were best of friends, you know, for, sure. for years. And he goes, he's absolutely right. So then Roddy started getting in the whole philosophy about, hey, you guys are the nasty boys. Come out there. He taught us a lot of things. He taught us one main thing was when we go out for television, he said, don't rush to the ring. 
He said, mm-hmm. take your time because that means the camera's going to be on you that much longer. Even if you're taking your slow steps and, you know, cussing the people out and doing your nasty thing, sure. the longer you take to get to the ring, that means the camera's on you and you're getting that extra camera time. So just little things like that. And then also us being a nasty boys and him coming up with different things and just throwing us ideas. But like one of our mentors, uh, you know, and he's not here no more. Uh, God bless his soul. And he's a Minnesota boy. Is Mr. Perfect. Right. And, you know, he taught us all the crazy stuff and, you know, a lot of ribbing and joking and stuff like that that got us in trouble. But he was taught by <laughs> Mr. Fuji. And, of course, his dad was Larry the Axe yeah. and second generation. But he was another one that took us under his wing from Minnesota back in 1986 when we went through Vern Gagne's camp. So this was the first territory we started with was Vern. And, you know, we used to drive the rain truck and ref at first. And we drove all these towns. We drove, you know, Bismarck. We drove before, uh, uh, Grand Forks. You know, we stayed at the Western Ho. And, you know, so we, we really were brought up the old school ways where they taught you respect. Mm-hmm. We started with 22 guys in Burns camp, and we were the only ones to survive. Wow. And the only reason that was is because our car broke down, and we lived on the bottom of Brad's where the camp was. Brad Reagans, right. who was an Olympic champion, he was a bronze medal winner mm-hmm. in Greco-Roman in 1976, and then they boycotted the 80 Olympics, and then he went with Vern, and Vern had him at his, his trainer to train professional wrestlers, but... Not um, the art of professional wrestling. It was more like getting them in shape and punishing you because he knew what the hell he was doing. Right. He threw uh, Vader through a, a shower door and Vader just came from the hand. <laughs> he was about 400 pounds and he suplexed him right through the, the shower in, in his in his uh, you know where the, where the camp was. Sure. And uh, you know and then uh, Raider Crippler Stevens would come in, Wahoo mm-hmm. McDaniel's, Vern. You know, after you, Brad has you beat down, you can't even lift your arm. Vern would come down, you know, 60, 70 years, he'll take off his tie and put you in shooter holes where you're yeah, screaming it, for your life. You it, know? It, it, Almost like the Heart Foundation, sure. you know, Stu's, Stu's camp. You know, it was, yeah, it was a dungeon. Yeah. It was a, well, it was a mental uh, thing on how the business is, how you should have respect for the business. And, I mean, they can't do that anymore, uh, you know, nowadays. But it did teach the boys respect for the business that you're getting into. This ain't no joke. Because a lot of people and a lot of fans sometimes, you know, use the F word, you know, which is it's fake, it's phony. But actually, you know, I've been in it 34 years now. I'm just up here after six weeks. I just had another knee replacement. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the, the bumps and bruises are real, man. I mean, it, is, it takes a toll on your body. And any wrestler, you know, from Hulk Hogan to Bret Hart to Hacksaw, uh, all of our buddies are going through, you know, different problems, sag, neck problems. Mm-hmm. So if you put a, a significant amount of time in the business, you're legitimately screwed up at an older age. Right. And, you know, I've I've helped out a couple independents as a referee, and they actually had me go into a couple battle royals. Well, and you, you see well, actually, me, I weigh about... like thrown into a lion's cage. Right. I weigh about a buck oh five. Yeah. And, you know, it's... And that, that's no trampoline. Why in there. is there really a referee in a battle royal? <laughs> they were, yeah. The, you know what I mean? the promoter came up to me and goes, Do you want to be in a be battle a royal? In that ring, you right, exactly. Know, the truth, uh, the referee is a big part of the match, too. Yeah. yeah. You've got to be right in there, and then you got to know. So the most, ref, one of the most important match, parts. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, talking about you know this area, when we, we moved to Minneapolis to train, and um, you know, we 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 just we, we went through camp. We were one of three guys only to make it through that camp. Sure. Like like what, what everything that was on Ric Flair's documentary that said about Vern Gagne's training camp was exactly true about paying your dues and stuff. But um, we were thinking about you know, well, let's be like a killer squad or mercenaries or army. You know, well, let's think of a tag team we can do. You know, because the tag team wrestling was huge, and we, that's what we wanted to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't. It was Vern Gagne's daughter, uh, Don Donna, right? Donna Gagne, who used to do commentating for the okay. ESPN shows and stuff. Yep. Um, we would hang out with her, and we, we were young, so we'd go out, and we, you know, we were crazy, and you know, we'd be <laughs> mean by Kurt Henning and stuff like that. And one, we came back, and she's nodding her head one morning. We're in for interviews at the AWA mm-hmm. office, and she goes, "You, I got you guys. Don't need a name. You're you're just two nasty boys. I'm telling you." And we went, "What? What did you just say?" And right at that, about three months before that, you know, back in the day, it was mm-hmm. uh, Prince was 
like gold. He was in First Avenue. Yep. Uh, Hennepin Avenue was still badass. The Target Center wasn't there yet. Old Minneapolis was still intact. You know, sure. we'd go down and party and stuff. We'd go crazy. But um, that song, Janet Jack just put out Nasty yep. Boys. You know what I mean? I remember you guys and walking we went, the aisle we to went, that. Oh, my God. That she just hit the nail on the head. And that she actually gave us the name. Yeah. You know, after going out with me. You know, we went, That's, that is perfect. Yeah. Almost like what, you and know. Our first leather jackets were actually... Uh, women's raincoats from the fat lady shop. Wait no a minute. Yeah. There was no leather in them. Yeah. <laughs> they were, they were, they were no like, leather, they were like, look, the, there was a shiny raincoat that looked like it was leather, but it was leather. Yeah. And, hey, uh, and, and, uh, D- Dusty Rhodes, when we went to, to, down to Florida Championship Wrestling, goes, what is that? Naga hide that you're wearing there? Because it looked like a damn, like a shiny uh, plastic bag, sure. basically, where fat lady raincoats right. went in a heavy woman's shop. You know, these look cool because we couldn't afford leather. Sure. We, we, got, we got fired the first time from the <coughs> burning down uh, the Western Ho and Grand Forks, but we we weren't the only ones involved in that shooting fireworks off in the hotel. Uh, we were sent down to uh, Tennessee, mid south, and Jerry Lawler and uh, uh, Jeff Jarrett's mm-hmm. dad, Jerry Jarrett, and Bill Dundee were down there. But Lawler's one that took us aside and said, hey, you guys call yourself the Nasty Boys, but you're dressed in regular wrestling gear. Mm -hmm. You know, why wouldn't you be dressed like a street thug and this and that? And that gave us the thing to put the sweatshirts on. And, by the way, our bodies aren't like Hulk Hogan's or Lex Luger's or the Ultimate Warriors. Sure. So any chance to cover up our bodies and just have our arms, so that's all we had to really work out was our arms. (laughs) It was great with us and, and the graffiti and... And, and get that kind of style. So, so Jerry Lawler helped us out too to get mm-hmm. to, to, to enhance the thing. So it was a process. You know, that was before we ever made it to WCW. That was five years in between there. All them little things got us to where we finally were. By the time we hit New York, we were ready to rock and roll with our gimmick. We, we had our matches down good, but the AWA helped us all out mm-hmm. because we were good friends with Marty and Sean, the Rockers. We had fabulous matches with them. We learned off them. Uh, even uh, Pat Tanaka and, and Paul Diamond, you know, yep. they were bad company, good workers, and they were teaching Buddy Rose and uh, uh, what's his name? Pretty boy, uh, Doug Summers. Doug Summers. Summers. Yep. And we learned off them guys, and he taught us too. Colonel the beers. All we actually got there. to work with Greg Gagne yeah. and Kurt, yeah. which we, which yeah. we got tested by them. Sure, it was like a test, you know, to get. Oh my God, wrestling. Because Kurt. at the time they never put two young guys together. It was always an old veteran with a young guy, an old veteran with a young guy. And here they took put two young guys together that we knew each other. And it worked out, you know sure. what I mean? But we knew each other since we were 10 years old, so... I was just going to say... I've been a bastard for 46 years. Well, to, to, <laughs> to, to, to come, after knowing each other for so long, to come to Minneapolis, it was like being... We came from, we grew up in eastern Pennsylvania. And to come to, when coming into Minneapolis... We're like, oh my God, we found a home away from home. Sure. They they love to do the same thing we do: drink beer and lift weights. <laughs> we were we made a uh, right, Jimmy Younger down there. That it was called the gym in Plymouth. We yeah. lived in Hamill with Brad, the Road Warriors, the Road Warriors sure. gym. Yeah. We met you know uh, we met a whole bunch of buddies that be well, like Wayne Bloom and them guys mm-hmm. that became the Beverly 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 Brothers. brothers him and Mike Enos to Barry Darso, which was one of the demolition, Hawk and Animal, Warlord, all the, and then Kurt Henning and Rick Rude, oh all God. the guys that came out of that area down there. And then all these towns, I, I asked the guys up here now about, the, we used to come, scour North and South Dakota, all of Minneapolis, mm-hmm. all the way up to Thunder Bay, to all Minnesota, Wisconsin, every little town. They were gymnasium packed. Indiana, Iowa, that packed. was Burns territories. And they were yeah. all these uh, high school gyms and civic centers, I mean, mm-hmm. packed. We were like, just had the perfect timing. It was a great t- territory and great people. I mean, you froze your damn ass off. Sure. But, I mean, it really didn't bother you. you know, when you right. when came from Pennsylvania to here, now I'm living in Florida since the 80s. Now I come up here and oh my god, I'm freezing. You know, my work is still just like Stu Hart did. Have to be tough, stiff matches. Yeah. He didn't want no bullshit. He wanted people getting hit, people getting body slammed, people looking like, you know, 
they're actually ripping somebody's head off, and that's how we were trained. Right. So then we got the, you know, the, the label as being stiff, but, you know, Kurt and them said, you can use that forever, that you're still green, you know, but uh, that's the way we were taught, you know, and that's the way Vern distilled. He liked that. He liked getting the amateur wrestlers in there. He liked getting the, you know, the different, the different guys in the... You know, at the time, he was one of the top territories. It was AWA, NWA, World Class, and then you had Vince. As it was a WWF at the time, and, and Vince Sr. was running it. So mm-hmm. then were the four major, you know, uh, wrestling companies at the time. Yeah. Uh, when did you guys decide that you first wanted to get into pro wrestling? Um, well, we, we sort, of, sort of, we were driven in into it in a way because of how we, we we were like that growing up sure the stuff we did we, we what we did when we were younger the crazy fighting and drinking and you know troublemaking and uh he got so he got thrown out of the army and i got thrown out of college and then we were really getting in trouble at home and then you know it came up uh i think it was um one of our local buddies knew Mr. Fuji or something like that because we grew up in Allentown, PA. Oh, George Allen. Yeah, well, okay. we, we grew up in Allentown where WWF at the time would film TV at Ag Hall sure. in downtown Allentown. And they would stay at called the George Washington Motor Lodge. I'm talking you would see Sergeant Slaughter's limo down there, Andre the Giant, the George Steele, and Arnold Stolen, Old Albano, Jimmy Snuka, but, uh, all everybody, the old Roddy Piper, everybody, the old WWE, which I don't know if you got that television out here at that time. We did, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? But it was classic stuff, but that was where we grew up. And so for some reason, we decided we're, we're, our, our, our mentor, our guide's going to be the guy that ate turnbuckles and said, you, <laughs> we follow George Steele. A good friend of ours who, who uh, played for Super Bowl rigs, played for Oakland Raiders, L.A. Raiders, uh, Washington, uh, and also the 49ers, uh, Matt Millen, and he was a GM for the Detroit Lions, is a very good friend of our family, his Sags' family, my family, and we were getting in trouble, and uh, he called us down to his house one day and said, you know, had a straight up talk with us and said, if you guys don't straighten up, we were about 21 at the time, because you're going to end up in jail and, and maybe f- do some time and all that stuff. He goes, you guys got to, uh, you know, uh, switch your ways. And he said, hey, now nah, you always like that pro wrestling. You know, Sags kind of liked it too. Why don't you try that? And me and Sags said, that's a good idea. And then we bugged George the Animal Steel. And after the matches, and would follow his car, and then he, you know, at the one time he had a, a girl with him, so <laughs> we bugged him, and then he, he actually called me on my phone because the guy that was managing the place told us we wanted to get in the rest, and that we were the guys that were following him all, all around. So he called us down, and I was at work, and Sag was at work to come down to the uh, Quality Inn, and he had uh, Mr. Wonderful, Paul Orndorff, Bob Orndorff Jr., and Jimmy Schnucker there to beat us up, to stretch us, sure. and we were at work. And uh, we said, hey, I'm sorry, Mr. Steele, but we can't go this and that. And he says, well, if you're serious about being a pro wrestler, there's only one camp to go to. Go up to Vern Gagne's camp. That'll either make you or break you. Yeah. And and it almost broke us, but he was right. I mean, it was the right yeah. camp to go to. No bull crap. It's either gonna you're either gonna make it through there and be somebody, or you're not gonna make it through the camp. Sure. Now you talked about uh, you guys kind of working stiff. Did you ever get any complaints from some of the other guys who didn't work as stiff? Or um, well, you can't. It, it, more like solid. You sure. know what I mean? You want? I mean, uh, you you know what I? You you from what being watching wrestling sure. all your life, you know yeah. what I'm talking. Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Um, it, we were believable. Yeah. You know I mean, and but not that it was we were hurting somebody. Right. But to, we it got us places that we wouldn't have got because we would, could work with anybody. Sure. We could work with the Rockers or like when we got our biggest break, Ole Anderson threw us together because back in the day the guys were working that style. You know, where the you know the old school style like. Uh, um, you know, um, soft and everything like sure. that, and nobody wanted to touch the Steiner brothers. Right. They're, everybody's afraid of them because they're throwing suplexing people left and right and throwing around. So we'll work with them. 
And we did. And we, 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 nobody wanted to work with them. We were 300 Everybody pounds said, a piece. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and we're getting Absolutely. suplexed across, off the top rope, across the ring. And we, we, they, we, we, they, in the mouth with barroom fighters. It was like, who cares? And right. But they we're took their friends with them today and, and they, they liked it and we liked it and the matches got over and, and that Halloween Havoc match we had with them, uh, in 1990, that's the match that got us to WWE. A, a week later, Hulk Hogan called me and said, Vince McMahon wants to talk to you, wants to bring you up. And I told him he was full of shit, and that's <laughs> always Vince. And, uh, you know, we talked, and then all of a sudden I said, Sag, they want us to come up there, and we made a decision. That was October 30th was the match. By November, with me, him, and Undertaker all went up from WCW to WWE together, or WWF. And right. we all started, and we were all in the Survivor Series that first yeah. time, and they put us against the Bushwhackers, and you had the Road Warriors and all these mm-hmm. great tag teams there, and they push us and put us against the Heart Foundation, and we win the belts. And it was a surprise to everybody, even us. Right. But, you know, a lot of heat there, because the Road Warriors were there for a whole year, and didn't get the belts, yet this and that, they're going... What are you, like a nasty boy, you know, they come right in and get the belts. And we had the belts for about eight months, and we lost them to the Joe and, uh, you know, Mike Hawk and Animal uh, mm-hmm. for SummerSlam. But we were established once, boom, WrestleMania 7, we won them belts, and the people hated us. We really had true heat. Sure. Yeah, it, you know, some people come up when we're signing autographs now and go, I just want to tell you, when I was a kid, I hated your guts. I'm sorry, <laughs> son. I was just doing my job. Sure. Well, they, going back to that, when we, Ole Anderson brought, saw us in Florida work, mm-hmm. and we were wrestling for uh, the what, which became was NWA out of Charlotte, which is uh, Mid Atlantic, whatever. George Scott and all them guys, and Gene Anderson drove us down to. Uh, WCW for the first time we did a class of champions but soon after that we in, landed in Chicago mm-hmm. and Ole tested us he goes I want you to go out and do an interview and it was sold out because we used to wrestle Pavilion in downtown for WCW and WWE at the time or F we wrestled the, the Rosemont Horizon that was Chicago so we go we go out and right off the top we, like I said Rob said about being ready um, we do a hellacious interview. South Side scum. We're from New York City. We told him, you know, and sure. we, there's shit flying in the rain and thing. Now he goes, now, so that, that we pass that stage. Oh, he goes, I, I, I was just seeing what your reaction would be, but because I want you to do a contract sign to come back here at the Steiners, where, where we face go out, walk the Steiner brothers walk out. There's a table in the ring, an old fashioned contract for the tag for the titles. They were the champions. We go out and do a signing with him. He goes, he goes, well, you can mix it up a little if you want and d- talk about, you know, working the stiff and whatever. And we didn't know what we were going to do. We went out there. We They signed. Then we signed. And we slowly we picked up the belts and were holding them and looking at them. And we just took the belts and smashed the Steiner square in the face as hard as we could with those belts. Wow. I busted Ricky Steiner's eyebrow wide open. And he went from boom. We threw him out. It was the wildest shooting at angles, which set it up for the Halloween Havoc mm-hmm. match, which was the top match of that pay per view, yeah. no doubt. And I think we either Flair and Luger or Flair and Rick, Rick and somebody had to follow it, which wasn't easy to do because it got the match was so crazy. And over in that same match, Ricky returned it and bust, I mean, blew my head, the back of my head open with a steel chair. Mm-hmm. And so when I was in, had his brother, Scotty, in the Boston Crab, that the blood that was coming down on my face was from the back of my head. It was bleeding so bad. Oh, wow. So we we, we did that match. I mean, we, it just clicked and got over, and it was one of the best matches we ever had in our lives. Yeah, we were, and we were wondering ba- you know, the way like, things were the way things were done off the cuff back then, and just no writing, no planning, no nothing. Um, after the match, the way it, it just blew the seat, the, brought the house down. Oli goes, "We got our heat back, and we 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 we, we submarined them after the finish." The mm-hmm. Frankenstein and me or not, nah, I, I forgot who it was. It was me, but they, 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 we, we, the thing, we, we, were we threw him into the we threw Ricky into the post. Mm-hmm. So now we get back and Oli ain't done with his magic tricks. He goes, we gotta keep, we got I got another idea for thing. You're gonna Scott, Scotty's gonna do a in, be doing a heated interview live about you posting Ricky and in, in his head into the steel post. 
because after the match that we did to him, mm -hmm. you, but you're gonna you're gonna go out. But you know what? You dress up as a pot, points at me. My head's I got a four uh, three inch gash in the back of my head. It's ble profusely bleeding in the back in the lower back of my head from uh, Steiner's chair. And he goes, you're gonna dress up as a popcorn man. I went, okay. <laughs> they gave me a, they gave me a beard and a hat. My head's my 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 skull's wide bl blasted wide open, and I put the beard and hat on and a popcorn vest. Oh, and now now I'm just waiting in the back, waiting in the back there, and I'm in the background at Tony. Shavani's and Scotty's screaming, you like son of a bitches, you did to my brother, you don't think of the, and I'm like, the popcorn, in the, in the back, and all of a sudden, you see me in the background with the, with the, with the tray, like I had a board in it, right. and smashed Scotty, and the knobs came running out, and we beat the living crap out of him, all that was done like that, that whole angle on a on a whim, well, on if we were ready for, at that point in time to take it on, and we just ran with it, it was one of the biggest things we ever did in our wrestling well, career, and what what shot us forward in the world of wrestling. Wow. That, that we were in the business long enough, and, uh, you know, so we were with these signing, all right, we have this big angle with the, with the Steiners, should we do the job or not? You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So we were going back and forth, me and Sag, I don't know. So we took a guy we trusted at the time, Sullivan, and Sullivan pointed to me and said, Nobs, if you want to do it right, You'll take a Frankensteiner in the middle of the ring and let him pin you one, two, three, and then you get your heat back. Right. And we said, I said, no problem with it. And he gave me a Frankensteiner, it looked like it broke my neck. Pin me one, two, three. They were getting, you know, the arms raised. We got back up after that shit, blasted them, threw Ricky into the post, and then the other thing with the popcorn that kept the angle going, and nobody even knew. The, the, the us getting beat didn't even effing matter because, uh, you know, it just was a, an after thing. It would, but it, the crowd went crazy after the Frankenstein, and everybody knew when the Frankenstein was coming. You know, that was the Absolutely. that was the real deal. But but Kevin's the one that said, if you want to do it right, you'll do take the Frankenstein in the middle of the ring. And we had, didn't have a problem with it, sure. And they said, and we didn't even ask for our heat back. They said you'll get your heat back. So you're, you're talking about some genius guys of Ole Anderson, Kevin Sullivan. You know, I mean, it's changed today. I, I think sometimes too many writers in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not enough of the guys that were through the business that have great ideas and stuff like that. You know, it's good to see Paul Heyman back in there yes. and either brother Love uh, Pritchard because they've been they've been through a hell of a lot. You know, during their time, especially Paul Lee. He's been. Yeah. He's been there a long time, but it's always good to have the wrestling mentality in telling the stories than some Hollywood writer trying to write for somebody or trying to give somebody a gimmick or trying to tell them what to say. You saw that last reunion. The only guy that was off script was Stone Cold, and the place went crazy. Yeah. He just went and said his own thing like he always did, but everybody else kind of stuck to script. Even Hulkster, when he was out there, was kind of, you could tell he was... You know, they wanted him to say this, and, but not Stone Cold, and he got the biggest pop and, you know, the whole the whole nine yards, and that's the way wrestling was. Right. Nobody gave us, told us what to say. We used to do thousands of interviews, and they were all coming from you. Right. You know what I mean? And that's what made the Nasty Boys the Nasty Boys. Absolutely, you know? and it's, it's kind of like you were saying. There's so many writers now that it just doesn't feel as genuine as it did, like, in the 80s and the They're attitude there. writing like they'd be writing for a soap opera or anything. Any other show, but the none of them where everything in the old the the the, the days gone past was the, the the wrestlers knew what we were taught, and that's ring psychology. What works? How do you, how do you how, what what'll get the most heat? What'll be the best angle? Mm -hmm. They don't know that. They're just writing bullshit, right? And it produces bullshit. Well, that's why AEW you know I mean? is getting over right now, and mm -hmm. luckily they got a guy like Chris Jericho who's been through everything too, and he was right. a young kid when we we came in when he came into the business of WCW, mm -hmm. and uh, I listened to one of his interviews two weeks ago. He was oh, it was fabulous with you know, and they started chatting. Uh, uh, what's his name? Swaggers. His old oh, stuff he's doing, yep. and right away he cut the people off. He says, "No, that's old crap." <laughs> yeah. da, da, da. Cut him off in a dime because he's been through it. You need guys like that that's been in the business and that, and they're letting the guys talk and say what they want to say. There's not nobody. You know, you get your bullet points, and that's all you should need, and go out there and cut your own interview, and it makes it more, like you said, genuine. Right. And it really does. Yeah, you know? and, and fans aren't stupid. They they yeah. don't, I mean, look, like There's you said. There's some good matches out there. I watched that one tag match with the Young Bucks just recently, and, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, let me tell you something. 
there's, there's still nothing like the WWE. They're, right. they're, they're, they're number one. It'll take a long time for someone to be, be thrown in. They're everywhere. People love them. No matter if the product's down, there's always been a big cycle in wrestling. You watch. Mm-hmm. They'll be coming back around again, you know, especially now that they got competition because right. nothing's better than having competition. Sure. Vince hasn't had competition in a long time. Now he does. Now he's going to have to put the thinking camp on again because when WCW gave him competition, almost put him out of business, who was the last sole survivor, Vince. Vince, yep. Because Vince knows this business inside out, so it's hard to it's hard to get over Vince McMahon. He's a very smart man, and, and, and the people he has around him are very smart. And, uh, you know, too, you guys were around for some of the territory days, and um, just seeing the way wrestling is starting to come up again, I mean, I think a lot of these independents are almost reminiscent of some of those territory yeah. days. Yeah, but it, it, that's because it's a, there, for a long time, there was a void of learning uh, capabilities or learning right. territories for the younger guys. Right. Like when we broke in in AWA, we were lucky to be. It was a bigger territory at the time. Mm-hmm. And But we went down to Tennessee. We went to NWA in Charlotte. We went to um, uh, Florida. Mm-hmm. We went to Japan. We went, you know, traveled and worked for different places, different, you know, you got to learn, you know right. what I mean, where the, for a while there, there was nothing for the for the younger kids yeah, to sure. learn. So they were basically whatever indie match you could get on and walk <laughs> out. But not now there's actually, like you said, they're, they're, the indies, they're, they're coming up. There's Corgan's got... The NWA going. Yeah. They got Ring of Honor going pretty good. Impact. They got uh, yeah. Impact Wrestling's now got TV and, and doing well. Of, yeah, both Ring of Honor and Impact are actually on TV. Corgan's got the YouTube channel, but he's trying. But that's. And you got AEW. And AEW, so that's four different places now. People are go go and you can actually make money. Until AEW. Before these guys in independence were starving, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, like we did back in Florida days when we wrestled. We were making $20 a match, $30 a match. And you, you considered yourself lucky, night, too, it's, it's to make survived. that much. But nobody ever filled Even the void. Even no, the same way. Nobody Evan ever Drew was nobody filled the void. Payoff. Nobody filled the void of a, the second company since WCW. Right. The, the, the second company, WCW, was the greatest thing. Thing. Mm-hmm. But when they when they ran it out of business, there was none. That yeah. really hurt wrestling in a lot of ways. It did. And it was then, then it, it was down to fans. just one. Right now, the, the, and TNA was never a second company. Could never be known right. as one. It was a joke compared to what WCW was. Sure. AEW is now finally the first true second company. Now Coke has Pepsi. You know what right. I'm saying? Now, now that now we can roll. Yeah, and I basically, think basically, you know what I'm saying. It was sure. definitely needed in the business, but all not not take anything from TNA or Ring of Honor or mm-hmm. uh, NWA because that's all important too. Sure. In learning territories, like you said, it's all good for the young and good for the business and good for guys making money in the business. And also great for the fans. Yeah, absolutely. Got, they got so many different options to see where before. It was only one. You right. know what I mean? And that's why it, it worked so good back in our day because you had that uh, competition between WCW and Vince. Sure. You know, and back, going back and forth. And it was going back and forth back in the days when we first got hired in 1990. So right. it just didn't start with the you know the Monday Night Wars. They were always going at each other. Yeah. But during the Monday Night Wars, when Hall and Nash came down, that's when it finally got... Where it was head to head, where they act, were actually beating Vince there for a while, yep. and you know that was the first time ever they did that. But they were always in competition, and it always helped out. And and some people uh, that uh, love WCW never liked WWF, sure. and vice versa. But you know you, you you hear that a lot from from the fans. But you think a lot from the fans. You know the fans are sort of smarter than everybody thinks. So the worst and, and, the worst thing that could happen, and I don't think it will happen because of the guys that are or or in charge and in in the uh, uh, power positions at AEW is uh, the number two company to try to be like the number one company which mm-hmm. is all you know WWE and that's what would happen at the end with WCW right I mean uh, WCW they were was actually watching uh Raw while Nitro was going on, they had yeah. it on the camera. I mean, why would you even do that? But you know, WCW, even care about WCW was always know. its own entity and its own style, its yeah. own personality, its own flair. So what AEW has to do is be its own thing. The worst thing, mm-hmm. the possibly that could happen, 
I hope it don't happen, is let's try to beat Vince or be like mm-hmm. the the WWE. That's not what you we want to be your own thing, your own style, which they are. And I yeah, hope it stays that come way. around to, to being that. Yeah. But like I said, it'll take a long time to beat the man. He's the man for a reason. He's all over the world. You know, right. they're, they're an established name. Like uh, Triple H said, you know, when they were bringing up the... the NXT? And, uh, no, they were oh. bringing up AEW and the, the Wars. Oh, oh okay, we ain't just looking at the ratings between AEW. We're looking at the ratings of, you know, the Roseanne show, or whatever show was yeah. on the air at the time, you know, uh, uh, you know that's that's happening right now. Everything's coming. Yeah, yeah, ABC, ABC, CBS, they're going, you know, now they're on Fox. Right. You know what I mean? So, so they're after, they're not just looking at them against the rest of the company. They're looking at all the other ratings for when they're on Raw and this and that, and seeing where they're ranking, and it means a lot, especially in the you know television world. Right. And I, know? I think you know if AEW, like you said, if AEW sticks with just worrying about their own product yep. and because that's really what the fans were kind of crying for they were kind of getting sick of what you know, WWE well, it, was doing. it's getting sick of is what well it, what it just it, it morphed into and there's no stopping right. it and that is taking the top wrestling promotion which it start it was always a wrestling promotion wwf then wwe wrestling promotion mm-hmm. that needed television to promote the, the, the house, the, 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 the arena events for wrestling and pay-per-views. Now it's totally morphed into, it basically is a full-out television company. Mm-hmm. Where Ted Turner had WCW just as a, 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 a show, a show mm-hmm. to put on his programming. Right. So it was a, he was a television guy. Yeah. Now WWE is a te- pure out television company. That's why the guys are handed scripts. Mm-hmm. They're they're walk through their matches, and that's why they're told what to do and what to say. You're almost like you're like a soap opera or actor yeah. doing anything else. Mm-hmm. That takes a lot away from the way we were taught in the business, and I think it takes a lot away from how uh, it comes across on camera because it's all the same cookie cutter horse shit but being brought up and made by the same bullshit guys that shouldn't even be writing for the wrestling business period right in my point of view well, t- but you gotta produce so much television they say this is the way it is read it do what you're told or get out but now you can get out right yeah there's <laughs> before, more places to for go. the last 15 years but, there was no getting out. But right. Another Turner, 20 years, you know, there's nowhere to go. Now, you don't like it, you can go. That's right. a good thing. If yeah. Ted Turner wouldn't have merged with AOL, WCW would have never left because Ted mm-hmm. Turner said, and in, in front of all of us, he'll never let wrestling go mm-hmm. because that was one of the, the, the companies before he bought it, that kept his satellite going. That was the main drawback in the it made, championship wrestling. No, it made it, them money and it, all that. And he, they were no, on TBS. It, it made the wrestling made CNN. It made yeah. TBS. Yeah, exactly. That's what made, that was draw the, so the, the viewers he, he to his station. The loyalty, Ted Turner. Not, 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 not only the wrestling, though. Not only the loyalty. He knew the business. Yeah. yeah. It was. It, there's no season for wrestling. Right. So it's year round. So Ted knew there was three hot years. And three cold years. Mm-hmm. You got to stick with it in the cold ones for right. the hot one to come around. You know what I mean? Until the next rock comes or the next big thing happens. But he bought and the, it did. He bought the NWA off the Crockett's. Right. But the Crockett's were on Turner, and Turner saw they were making the money at the time, and he, they liked the for programming. And, and Ted's all about TV. So, but when they merged finally, mm-hmm. he didn't have that say. He did he was old in England when they sold the, the whole thing? Got sold on and everything, and he was pissed. Yeah. Because he said one thing he never wanted to lose was the wrestling. He really liked the wrestling. He didn't even call it that. He called it wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he said, and he said, uh, you know, uh, he had a couple of talks. Really nice man. And, and but if, if they wouldn't emerge, WCW would have never went nowhere. Turner would have had him on for life. Right. Look at all the cable networks that were born off it. Look yeah. at the power that Vince McMahon had by holding up the, his product. You want to make your cable company? You need yep. me. Exactly. USA. You know, uh, T, you know, TN, uh, uh, TBS, TNT. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, USA. Uh, yeah. If you want to look what's uh, Spike with the TNA, yeah. you know, you want to you want to make and then the shows that come on before and after wrestling, then they grow and then so is your cable network. That wrestling could still 
programming of wrestling to still mass appeal, make or break a cable, or now for the first time a network station. Right. You know what I mean? It's, they're it's, in the hot seat now, so, being on so, Fox. It's so funny though because they're now on a major major network. Yeah. On Fox. Yeah. Before and, before it was only nobody, a special. No, then. Nobody even knows in the 1990s because of Matt Millen and me and Sag knowing Matt Millen. I asked Matt to get a hold of Ed Gorn from Fox Sports, and I actually had him, me, Hulk, Hulk's lawyer, and the head of Fox, uh, David Hill, and Ed Gorn, and we had a meeting at Fox to bring wrestling in there. Mm-hmm. And then Turner got a, uh, 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 you know, heard a, you know, wind of that Hulk. They were talking to Hulk, maybe trying to build the wrestling league for Fox, and Rupert Murdoch and Ted hate each other. Before you know it, they gave Hulk some more money, I think, and then Hulk never pursued it more, but you know, we were at the table, I was there, and, and now look at 20 years later, Fox has WWE. Yeah. And, it's and, and, ba- and back then, like always, Hawk got paid an extra $15 million and we got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're pretty good friends with Hulk. Right? Some things, some yeah. things never yeah, change. He's a, he's a good guy, man. He's yeah. he did really do everything for this business. So did Flair. Mm. They gave their they gave their life and uh, hearts and souls to the business. And you can see it today. You know, they're they're both all you know physically. You know, all the bumps and all that stuff. But all the stuff that you don't even see behind the scenes for children's hospitals and Make a Wish and this and that. They, they don't publicize that, but they do a lot for a lot of people, and they've been doing it for years. I right. Mean, Flair for 40 years and Hulk for almost 40, I would think. Yeah. You know, but the two great guys that have as role models, and everybody that's underneath them, like the Pipers and all, are fantastic, too. We, we lost a lot of a lot of good friends yeah. early, and that, that sucks, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really good still to have them two around because them two, that was the major product. Flair down WCW was the main guy. Well, two guys oh, in WWF, they were holding the wrestling but world. world. You look, the at the, look at the supporting cast though they had. Sure, oh, yeah. you got to get like two guys that really deserve the recognition. Really yeah, got absolutely. Paul had Roddy and Macho, mm-hmm. and Rick had guys like uh, uh, Lex, mm-hmm. Dusty. Sting, you know, that, you know, yeah. there there was a lot of great wrestling built there, you know what I mean? And uh, I'm not I'm only stopping it, mm-hmm. Roddy and Macho, but they're at that level, and they were very unique guys. That was a top, that top yeah, spot. Yeah, Arn Anderson, yeah. Oh, the God. Horseman, yeah. you know, you had all that, you had all that stuff. So, uh, you know, definitely different, different styles, different supporting casts, and mm-hmm. you know, I mean, like, and when we go out to a lot of autograph sessions, a lot of fans say they missed that. 80s, 90s kind of group of guys because there was all characters there, you know, the sure. Axles, the Jakes, the this, the that, the other. I, I like think it. what they really miss is that the, they, the, the fans know a lot of what's coming across isn't from the guys' hearts. Right. You know, like when we, you're doing an interview, it's for Moorhead uh, and you're wrestling these guys. That's what they would tell you. And then you'd, you'd boom, you'd think of the, what something to say about Moorhead and piss the people off and mm-hmm. about the team you're wrestling. We did that all on our own. Yeah. People know when you're reading off a piece of paper. Sure. And they I can tell it. that. Everything's, like they said, the same. That That's what that's what they're missing about our time. Right. It's really you good to be mean? back in the area again because we started here. So, yeah. So and tonight we're signing autographs over at the Courtyard Marriott. Uh, yeah, and then so, tomorrow you got an event down in Minneapolis, don't you? Well, yeah, tomorrow night's Minneapolis. Yeah, that they're, uh, this uh, brewery's uh, made our own beer uh, called the Pit, Pit Stop Pale Ale. <laughs> and that's coming nice. out uh, uh, tomorrow. It's first run. I don't know how it tastes. I hope it don't taste as bad as uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Chavo Guerrero's. Tastes like refried beans and rice. Oh, no, no it's, it really no. tastes good. I mean, <laughs> we all, I mean, him and Tom and Kid made a joke. You know, he, he gave it to us. We were at a signing in San Bernardino. Yeah. So he goes, hey, after we taste this, let us all spit it up and go, ugh. ugh. So he's standing there. He gives us all one. We toast and we take a big swallow. And we all go, whoa, what's in there? And he goes, you guys are a bunch of... Fucking assholes. <laughs> he goes, and we, he started laughing because he is knew there, he was going to get that response. It's really good. Uh, yeah. Chavito's beer. Yeah, Chavo's a good guy. And he's, uh, 
He won an Emmy and everything. He's the stunt coordinator for the glow wrestling that's on TV. I don't sure. know okay. if you knew that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and you know who used to do it before when they first started? Who's that? His uncle, Mondo. Mondo okay. Guerrero. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, it's all in the family. But the Guerrero families, you know, just like the Hart families, they are all really good friends with me and SAG. We wrestle sure. with all of them. We wrestle with... Uh, Chavo's dad, we wrestled with Hector, we wrestled with Mondo, we wrestled with Eddie, you know, just like uh, uh, the Hart Foundation, you know, I mean, and we wrestled with, uh, you know, Brett Owen, I mean, just, uh, and then uh, Baby Boy, who's part of the family, Jim the Anvil, part sure. of the family, so, you know, uh, Henning, the, just the Henning family, then seeing the, the kids growing up today, like Charlotte Flair, we know oh. her since she's a little kid. She is so talented. Uh, Wyatt. Uh, Bray know, Wyatt, yeah, that's yeah. that's the Rotundo's boys yeah. and, and B team, Kurt's boy and 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 Rotundo's boy both tagging. Yeah. You know what I mean, so it's good to see. You know, they used to run around the locker rooms and they were small. And now they're up making money and and doing a great job and sure. making their fathers proud. You know, sure. uh, hey, is there still a beer around called Grain Belt? I believe there is. Oh my yep. god, we used to drink that, but, down <laughs> it, 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 but it was the most bland. What did yeah. you drink? <laughs> but, it, but I think our nasty. <laughs> Ale is going to be sort of like under the realm of a grain, good, okay. good, mature grain belt. Tomorrow, right. tomorrow <laughs> a good a friend of ours, uh, Minnesota Viking Hall of Famer, is coming out to see us, John Randall. So, really? Yeah, he's a good nice. friend of ours. So we told him, I sent him in. He's, you know, he's all psyched up. Big wrestling fan. Hey, yeah. no, one made a, no one made a big thing is uh, um, Line and Klugel. Yeah. It used to be just a local thing in, in Wisconsin and Minnie. Yeah. We used to drink that back in the day. Now it's in down. I can get it in Florida everywhere, Lineys. My dad loved Line of Kugels. Yeah. All the a, different flavors. Yeah, it was yeah. good beer. Yeah. Really good beer. Absolutely. You still got the, some, we went down that street last night with the Bob, you know. Uh -huh. He's a very nice man, brought us up here to do the signing tonight. Sure. You know, and he has some big plans along the way of bringing some other uh, wrestling superstars up. But the one street, it just looks like it didn't change. I don't know what street we went by, but that's a bunch of bars on. It's a Broadway. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I said, man, I remember this. And then yep. you're talking about 25 years ago since we've been here, you know. Yeah. Running down and playing pool tabs with Kurt Henning. Freezing, yeah. cold, freezing, free, freezing cold. I don't know how you, <laughs> what we, now, I go, why would we even want to drink beer when it's like 90 below? But you still would. Well, it takes your mind off the cold. Yeah. We go, we, we'd stop at all those little bars with Kurt Henning. He'd take us mm -hmm. in there to play pool tabs and drink. Well, we, I don't know how the hell we made and it back to Minneapolis. And the ice fishing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's huge around Which here. Which is just a reason to drink, but on the ice. Sure. That's just you sit in there and drink your ass off. Right? Exactly. Um, now the uh, WWE Network has come on. Um, it's I, awesome. I love it, personally. Yeah. And yeah. Do you guys, now that you got probably a little bit more time on your hands, do you ever go back and watch some of your old well, stuff? Well, I, I, I don't, but know what the good thing is, is the younger kids yeah. that yeah. weren't even born, See our stuff. they they their jaws drop because they go look it up on there mm -hmm. and compared to what they can watch on TV today see what the stuff the crazy stuff we used to do and how we they, and they go that it really brings a whole nother air to your viewing well, population really, that what wasn't really there what really does it for is the parents that watched yeah. us when they were their age so this they is who I the they show yep. the kids when I was yeah and show the kids right. so the kids that are 9, 10 years old know are wrestling that's pretty wild so I love the network they couldn't, they, couldn't yeah. they a better they, thing but they bought every every library known to man I think yeah. they got uh, they got all AWA I know Florida Championship Wrestling where we were at Mid-South everything yeah. Yeah. everything where we were our all they could watch every level of our career from the get go mm -hmm. to, the, to to the end. You know, it was the yeah. now. AWA. Yeah. Every, yeah. Yeah. All of our stuff. Yeah. And as a guy who's watched wrestling for over forty years, I just love going back and watching some of that old stuff because yeah. yeah. that was my childhood. I used to rush home on a Saturday night at five o'clock to turn on TV. You know what the, the most shocking thing is? Is the the interaction. When our matches were going, but the, mm -hmm. the, the re, of the people to the the match, right? Where that it, it seems like there's a void there now. Yeah. It's like it's more like a Japanese rep match. When we used to be in Japan, they sit there and they every once in a while yeah. clap. But I mean, the, the, you don't hear like that. There was people screaming, wanting to kill us, and all kind mm -hmm. of stuff going on in the crowds, like craziness and wild 
I mean, you couldn't hear her in there. You know right. what I mean? It's the, that you go, go, what the hell are we doing? Or it just was a different fan base. I don't know. Yeah, a lot of you the know? guys, it seems like they cheer for these big spots. You know, which is fun to watch, but you can't do that every single match. Right. You know, you're gonna, you know, well, get the, yourself the, hurt. The the, the 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 cruiserweight style. Mm-hmm. Me- the tasteful of lucha, tasteful of the Japanese style, which never got seen in the United States until mm-hmm. Access put on New Japan. Right. We've been doing that in Japan since the 80s and 90s, or, or even further. Sure. They, but in the United States, as a populace, never got to witness what was going on in Japan until now. Right. That's right. that style of wrestling. Mm-hmm. But when they get into something like they did when the Monday Night Wars are going on, I remember... Uh, Eddie Guerrero called me. Me, me and Nobbs came back from Japan with Eddie, Chris Benoit, and Art Bar. Mm-hmm. And Eddie called me at home and goes, "Says you, I, I'm, will you do me a favor?" I go, "What, Eddie? I, I, in my house?" And go, I go, "Because when you mention my name, I'm thinking I like maybe come to WCW. We just got back from Japan. We had the greatest time." I go, "Definitely." And I walk. Me and Nobbs went to center stage. And uh, right there was uh, Arn Anderson, Ric Flair, and, and Kevin Sullivan going over TVs next to the ring. I go, he goes, welcome back. We just came back from Japan. I go, hey, I just want to tell you something. Uh, Eddie, you know, Hector Mondo, the younger Guerrero, Eddie called me and said, would you, you know, would you like, you might like, like to come in. I go, him and Benoit are doing this stuff. They're like, great. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the cruiserweight, sure. like they were wrestling Tiger Mask and that mm-hmm. style of wrestling, but they had their own style. Sure. It wasn't like the big guy stuff, even in Japan, but it was amazing to watch. Right. And right, Kevin Sullivan, you know what? We're thinking of bringing a bunch of the guys in with the lucha and that type of thing. So when they're between the big matches, mm-hmm. they, people don't turn the channel to watch Raw. Right. And I go, well, that's a good idea. Cause we're gonna, he goes, because we're going to start this new show called Nitro. And I go, that, okay. Sure enough, here comes Eddie and that. And sure enough, within a year or two, everybody was rest, trying to wrestle like a, the like lucha, a lucha style. That's yeah. what became popular. Now that's what the popular thing is the no selling bump, million bump. And that ain't, that ain't mm-hmm. the way Japanese style exactly was, though. No. There was a lot of false finishes, but properly timed. And mm-hmm. when they did a false, you did a false finish in Japan, the house would come down. It was right. done right. That, uh, like, I just saw something that Ricky Steamboat was saying about too many high spots, and mm-hmm. like almost every high spot has a guy's finish in it, well, we which were, has been sold. When we were, you know what I'm saying? So it sort of took over. Sure. You know what I mean? And that, that, that's at, not a good thing either. If you look at the older days, let's face it, there wasn't a guy under 250. No. Everybody no. was 250 and above. Everybody was big barley and this and that. Now all the guys are weighing about 220 yeah. or lower, and they're doing a lot of high flying stuff. But back in the well, day, Vince wouldn't even go for the smaller no, guys. He'd go the, for the, the, the you know, and Dynamite Kid might have been small, but he was jacked up. He was about yeah. 250, like he's, muscular all the way. You like know? he's saying that to to get the people to have this just during our matches of against job guys on TV, it was a, a riot of like what's going on. You didn't need no crowd noise or nothing. Right. Now, now, like what he's saying is uh, you can't the guy's got to do like a double ginsey over the top rope and fly three rows out into the seats and fall on people to get people to cheer one time yeah like a ricochet yeah yeah, but yeah like that, so. crazy I'm like yeah. what, the, what the hell you know how do you even there's no selling here you know what I mean yeah. Ricky Steamboat just did an interview about that and I go I totally I read it I go I totally agree with Ricky saying is there's just no when you something you do something devastating and it looks so good sell it right you know what I mean you don't just get up and run into another spot Right. Behind the other things. And I think one match that really sticks out for me where you don't need all the high spots to get a good match, WrestleMania 25, Shawn Michaels against The Undertaker. Yeah. That, I mean, it's more. Yeah, and that that's still one of my favorite matches of all time. Yeah. You yeah. know? And I just. Further, first of all, Taker, f- for his size, yeah. is a very smart, psychological, and a great worker. Mm-hmm. Because of because of the agility and the sports athleticism, but Sean is a ring master. Right. But to put those two together, just almost like having Bret Hart and Stone Cold, that's mm-hmm. like a match made in heaven. You right. know what I'm saying? Or yeah. even even though it turned out in a bad way, Sean and Bret because mm-hmm. they were not always at each other's throats all the time right. in that top spot, uh, dog eat dog position. But there's two great two of the greatest well, that, wrestlers. That match 
between Brett and Stone Cold was what made Stone Cold. Yeah. Because he was bleeding and then he didn't, yeah. didn't give up. He passed out, but the blood was coming out of his face like it did Sags in Halloween Havoc. Right. And the people bought into it, and then that Stone Cold was born after that, that mm-hmm. match, really. Right. Then it was, the, you know, the rattlesnake. Yeah. And who's was, was, was great as, one of the greatest. And our other guy that we know that we used to feed him beers when he was 12 years old is Dewey. <laughs> Yeah. The way in the Rock Johnson. Yeah. Yeah, we used to feed him beers. Uh, <laughs> the Rock and and uh, 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 Rock, Rock, and Rock and, you know, uh, his mom, uh, Rocky Johnson Rocky. and his wife right. would, would go out for like a because we were all wrestling Tennessee and living in mm-hmm. the same apartment complex, so they would want at night to go out for dinner. So they asked me and Sag to watch the way. So we feed him <laughs> beers and all that right. stuff, and the Rock would come down. You feed my kid beers, and the, you know he says it, and even uh, the Rock said it to my. Wife a couple of years back he goes yo yo man fed me beers when I was twelve years old I said well you're the number one actor now maybe you should right? give me some residuals you know? <laughs> hey that could be a reality show nasty babysitting hey oh you know, my god with the, with the poor with the, it's like being a fly in the wall no you kidding. know in, we're in that in the house the Grateful Dead lived in and uh, in Frisco yeah, and, but, in the apartment in Nashville oh my at god. any given time you could have Kurt Henning staying with us in a one bedroom the Rockers um, yep. Scott Hall. Uh, yeah, we're all laying on the floor and everything. And one one uh, one night, uh, Marty the idiot was burning all of his bills in our fake fireplace. But you know it has one of the uh, you know the, the flame on it, so it's gas. Right. When you turn it on. He almost started the whole apartment complex on fire. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm getting rid of these buildings. And that's not a real fireplace, you idiot. <laughs> we always had something going on there in Tennessee. Tennessee was a good territory, too. Yeah. But all of us guys from AWA came down to, to you know, and wrestled for Tennessee then. The sure. Rockers came down. Kurt was doing the, uh, after he beat Bockwinkle, he was going around with the belt. So he'd go wrestle Lawler with the AWA belt and this and that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Nick taught us a lot, too, Bockwinkle. He was a very... Yeah. Yeah. Man. He was. You know, I loved great, watching great him wrestle. Worker too. You know, yeah. With the watch, hit one of his matches. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, his own style. But you know, it wasn't our style. But you really respected it just watching it. You know well, I mean? even back when he was uh, feuding with Hogan in the AWA, even as a kid, I thought, man, Nick is schooling Hogan like you wouldn't believe. I mean, I like I like Hulk, but you know, as far as wrestling goes, I think Nick Bockwinkel had it all over. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. Well, so, the technical Nick, wrestling, you right? Beat him. Yeah, yeah. 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 There was Nick doing stuff, but you learn off guys like that. Right. Like when we were for for uh, tag teams to got us to, you know, when we first broke in AWA and we became friends with them, mm-hmm. the guys who really taught us and were innovators uh, were the rockers. They yeah. were coming up with all that stuff sliding through your, even though Rock and Roll Express was kind of doing us their style, the mm-hmm. rockers had their own style with their own little different you know, stuff that was a little bit more dangerous than what the Rock and Roll Express was doing at the time. You sure. know what I mean? Absolutely. And could they wrestle? Both Marty and Sean could, could Sh- both work. Yeah. Sean was trained by um, Jose, Jose Lothario, Lothario in, yeah. down in San Antonio. His father knew him. Mm-hmm. He had a thing, and I, there, Sean could work. He's like a Bob Orton from, yeah. from the day too, he though. stepped in the ring. But, but then he, Marty was older, mm-hmm. but Marty could do the exact same. But same. Sean even, if, but Sean just had that natural ability yeah. to work like a machine. It was like, well, working with them guys is like a dream for us. Sure. Like you, uh, your, the producer out there goes, I saw you guys up there in, in Bemidji, and it was a, maybe 97 or something. Like we have a, so we got a year or two in the business, and we're wrestling, getting the rest of the rockers in Bemidji in a house show. Right. You know how we tore that down? Not us. They were, we were getting led by, by two experts. Yeah. And it was like yeah, a right night off. A beautiful five, thing. It was a, the greatest later, match. Then, five years later, six years later, we were wrestling them at Royal Albert Hall in England. And we had one of the best matches yeah. because we just knew each other like like butter and bread, dude. Sure. That's how we went there. And we, we had matches like that with the Steiners, too. And yeah. A lot of people complained about the Steiners. We had we had great matches with them. Never complained. We came. We were probably on the road. I would say fifteen to twenty days, right. and we went out, got right on a plane to go on a Europe tour, mm-hmm. and we they did it. We went straight to, from the airport and drove the buses to Wembley, uh, by Wembley Arena there, and we pulled up right to Royal Albert Hall. First time, one of the first times me and Nas were in there, and Undertaker there was. A lot of people dress like the Nasty Boys, but there's probably a hundred people dressed like Undertaker. Thousands of people in the parking lot. When we pulled up. We walk right in the building, and it's a uh, wasn't an early night or afternoon show. And who do we 
go on one of the like third or second third match us me knobs and sean and marty mm -hmm. and after after all that coming off the road traveling to europe walk right into world albert hall and have to work and it was like we just went nuts and it, but again it was the rockers leading the way sure. working with them guys it was incredible it was an unbelievable match right a crazy yeah, but match. you know lod we had great matches with them and it, mm -hmm. uh, people said well they can only work one style but we were taught all the ways to work you know we can work the, t the tough guy street fight gimmick we can work we can actually work work arm drags hip tosses all that because that's what we learned from Vern. Mm -hmm. you know what i mean and the rockers in that style you know what i mean it, it it was more of a wrestling kind of thing. Sure. But, uh, you know, the, the Hart Foundation, great matches with them. We wrestled the Bulldogs over in Japan. I mean, we wrestled a lot of the great, great tag teams uh, in the, you know, in in the in pro wrestling, and, and we're honored to, to be part of that. And, uh, you know, it made us a better wrestler. Sure. Wrestling that. Well, let's, I mean? well, let's face it. Back in your guys' day, I mean, tag team was probably at its peak, in my opinion. Yeah, probably. I, I never looked at it like that, but you're probably right. Yeah, because you, know, you had, there, you was, had a, the there was an equal amount of tag teams to everything else. Yeah, you had the Bulldogs. You had the Hart Foundation. You had you guys. You had LOD. You had, had the Steiners. The Steiners. The, the Rougeos. The, the, you know, uh, Natural Disasters. Don't yeah. forget about the Whackers. The, yeah. the Bush Whackers, absolutely. It's like an ass fight. Pat and, and, right? and, uh, <laughs> Pat and Paul did the... The, they went from the bad company in Tennessee. They did Orient Express up there. Mm -hmm. um, then we got Typhoon and Tugboat got together and made the natural disasters. And that, that wasn't an easy. Earthquake could work like a, a dream. Mm -hmm. But Typhoon was like a, working like with a Mack truck. Right. It was oh Tugboat. <laughs> Tugboat <Yep. laughs> became Typhoon. And he was a typhoon. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, but wait. Friends think friends about we're getting to wrestle with not only the Hart Foundation, then Owen and Jim mm -hmm. as a tag team, and then Owen and Coco, right? Or whichever came in first. Was it Owen Coco then with Jim, or Coco and with Coco took Jim's place? I think yeah. The Hart, the Hearts, Bret Hart, and then we wrestled a six man for a long time. It was us. Me, Knobs, and Jacques Rougeau mm -hmm. against the Bushwhackers and Bret Hart. That was classic. Or, or, or yeah. Boss Man was thrown in there a couple boss times. Boss Man yeah. and, and Roddy, too. Yeah, Roddy. The Bushwhackers and Roddy mm -hmm. against Me, Knobs, and I think uh, um wasn't the Mountie then. It was, uh, who else is there? Is it uh, Quebecers, maybe? No, no, no. Okay. Even somebody else besides Jacques that put him in us as a heel. I don't forgot who it was. One time, down at WCW, it was Me, Knobs, and Rick Rude. Me, Nobs, and Rick Rude against, against uh, Sting, uh, Sting Flair. Flair and Flair. Flair. Wow. That was crazy. And yeah. we got then we got to wrestle because either Hawk or Animal were hurt. So it was Hawk and Davy Boy. Mm -hmm. We got to work a bunch. And Davy Boy and Sting right. against me and Nobs. Yeah. And then the three man the the, the six man's where they put me, Nobs, and Rude together, and we'd wrestle a combination. Flair, Sting, Lex and they'd flip it around in there a bunch of different ways. Sure. Sting and Davy Boy, Sting and Lex, you know, it was it was pretty pretty awesome time to be in a tag team. No kidding. Because of who we got as young tag team got that end coming up you had like they put Lord Steve Regal and Bobby Eaton were the Blue Bloods mm -hmm. and then Harlem Heat came into that and we did a big thing with Harlem Heat the, the, the public enemy's not here no more right. yeah. they sort of were like a young version of us mm -hmm. and it was the dumbass uh, Bubba Ray Dudley I, I actually really thought we could make money but he was such a mark um, mm -hmm. that uh he he was more of, of afraid of uh, who was going to get over more. I'm like, there's money to be mm -hmm. made here. You know, they want to see the Dudleys against the Nasties. Right. You know what I mean? And it, he just flushed that whole deal down the toilet because he, 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 he didn't know how to handle it, I guess. I don't sure. know. But I think we could have made a lot of money with them like we did with the public enemy. Same yeah. time. Young team came after us and go back. And I, was mm -hmm. with, I had a good time with Jeff Hardy at Ric Flair's birthday party. And he asked, <laughs> goes, hey. We always wanted to work with you guys, and I'd be like, I said, it'd be a dream to work with you, you and your brother. I said we wanted to work. You guys are great. We, we, I actually respect you as a team coming up. And he can, he goes up later. He goes to Knobs. He goes, hey, your partner said he would do it. You want to, you want to come in and wrestle? Goes Knobs. Goes, I can't freaking wrestle no more. <laughs> Knobs going, I can't, get, I can't really walk. How am I going to get in, in the ring? And the same thing. off. I think that's why you know, they're kind of trying to tease Stone Cold. But I really don't think Stone Cold will ever come back and wrestle again because. 
you know, let's face it, age is everything, man, and you're right. not the same body you do. And the way social media is today, you make one flub and this and that, then they then they bury you for life for the uh, a, 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 you know a career worth of good stuff that you did. One, one match, match. Could, they can you know your last match, whatever. If, if it ain't the greatest, you know, and you get ripped apart. And I think Steve in no position, why would he want to do that? Right. He's stone cold. He still goes out and gives the stunner, drinks his beer. That's all he has to do, Absolutely. man. Why have to, well, you don't have to get back in the ring again. And it been fucking hurts. And then he has a chance of getting hurt again. Mm. Maybe being paralyzed. Yeah, all he has to do is drink a beer, give somebody a stunner, and yeah, people yeah, go exactly. nuts. Exactly. Get I, on I, the I, mic. I, I, yeah. That's like, it. Uh, like the, 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 the chance that we didn't get, like another one would be like Edge and Christian. Mm -hmm. They were a really good tag team together. Yeah. They're, good, they're two good guys, you know what I mean? Yeah. But the, the Hardys would be like, would, would, would actually be like, but they did more crazier stuff, but it's almost like a Sean and, Sean and Marty. Sure. That's a, the skill they, the level they're at in it, as a tag team. You know what Absolutely. I mean? And they're, they're at an older age now, and they're still yep. pulling it off. Yeah, you that's know what I mean? true. It, 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 that's not easy, because they, they took serious bumps and did serious mm -hmm. things that hurt their bodies we in a actually, lot of ways. We actually... You know? uh, we're so Max Payne and Cactus in, yeah. in, in Chicago, and that's mm -hmm. when we started that street fight stuff, you right. know what I mean? And Ric Flair came in the back, and when we came, got back in the match, and people went crazy for it, Rick chewed us out in front of everybody and said, what the hell are you guys doing? How is anybody going to follow that? You're using the, uh, you know, shovels, this and that, and that, you know, and just buried us. And we all, we were like stunned, you know, we thought we had a great match. And then mm -hmm. that Tuesday, when we got back to center stage to wrestle in front of everybody, he apologized and said when he got off the plane, his young son, Reed, who's not here no more, mm -hmm. who's a good kid, uh, said he, that's all he was worried about. Dad, how the nasty boys and, and Cactus and Max Payne. That was the most incredible match in this and that. So I got to tell you guys, I was wrong. You were right because my mm -hmm. kid hasn't stopped talking about that. Yeah. So then it, then the next went on for us, and it was me and Sag against uh, uh, Max that kicked out because Kevin Sullivan wanted a piece of it and got right. Cactus in there, you know, and was Cactus's partner. And that was a, a, a hell because we were using stuff that was – you know, they didn't. Nobody was buying us that stuff. Sure. It was it was cast out of trash cans and anything we could find. And uh, I don't know who it was. Me and uh, uh, Cactus are going at it in the back, and this idiot comes and hits us with a uh, fire extinguisher, and it was one that cuts the oxygen oh, off. No. And I couldn't. Me or Cactus couldn't breathe, and we were already huffing and puffing, but it, it cuts <laughs> the oxygen off, and all of them were going. Uh, we we had couldn't catch the, a breath. The, the, we went into the Philadelphia. Uh, yeah. Broad Street bully match, and you're not, you know, you're a big hockey fan sure. up here from this series, big hockey. Yep. So we're from we're from Allentown, which is north of Philly, okay. okay. And the Broad Street bullies in the '70s, Bernie Parrot, David Doctor, David Schultz, mm -hmm. the whole crew, they were the Broad Street bullies, and the Flyers were badass back in the day. Sure. So David Schultz refereed our match in the Broad Street bully match at this Philadelphia Civic Center. Right. And that's when we did the street fight. And that was an incredible match. Went up as match of the year against Sean and Razor's ladder match. Oh wow! And they beat us, and we they were first, we were second in sports. The rest of, that's when Pro Wrestling Illustrated was yep. still a thing. Mm -hmm. So their big picture, and we were below them, came in second. I'm like, wow. bullshit! Our match is better <laughs> than that fucking ladder match, Sean. <laughs> and then, but then, no, but that ladder but match that we, Sean and Razor after, had was, was awesome. Was after incredible. We, yeah. After yeah. we did that, then eventually. You know, when after Sag got hurt, it started forming, and they actually made a division out of it. Yeah, the hard and time. Then, and then, when I, then, when I, yeah. then when I came because back. Because we had, when we did it, it was a psychological wrestling psychology put into a street fight where you use certain things during the match and integral parts of it. Mm -hmm. By the time it was, when, when Nobs is there, with the two years I was hurt, out on my neck, he, they were, the idiots were rolling down a dumpster filled with yeah. broomsticks and uh, sinks and I'm like and it's just like the, the match became what are they going to use next sure. almost well, like I, I what was the TV what was it what was they writing for in WCW at the end who's going to join the NWO next mm -hmm. well now the whole territory is NWO now what are you going to do uh, I guess the company's out of business <laughs> Yeah. You know, <laughs> really? Is that, they should have got another but, six but years out of that. I, it, uh, it really <clears throat> screwed me up big time because I went two years, was world champion four times, 
I had great matches with Bam Bam. Mm -hmm. You know, I had Nor me and Norman Smiley had good matches. Yeah. Remember when he used to scream? I do. But I was doing it, me and Fit Finley, but we were doing it every night, and they weren't buying us nothing. And when Fit Finley almost got his leg chopped off when he went through the table, and it was made with Formica, and his leg was hanging off, and most terrible thing I ever saw. And, and cut, he had, they had dead foot over it, mm -hmm. cut all of his nerves and everything. I was going to kill Eric Bischoff. And uh, Jimmy Hart pulled me away because he goes, you're not going to blame this on, you know, WCW. I said, you're not buying us anything. All you have to do is go down and to the Home Depot and buy us some stuff, the aluminum trash. And we're going to these old buildings, getting stuff that is not supposed to be used for this. We're, we're, we're actually, you know, using real crap here. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, when, when, you know but when it was so funny. Uh, Sandman you know for mica breaks. Yeah. You, you know the, yeah. The, what they used to put on ca uh, kitchen countertops. Mm -hmm. so a lot of the old tables had for mica on top. Sure. Yeah. When that breaks in half, like it's almost like laser porcelain laser laser tile yeah. uh, breaking, yeah. it's one of the sharpest things I've ever seen. I mean, you could be dead in a second. Absolutely. When, it, when it Formica breaks, it makes like a razor blade edge. Wow. That cut fit, fit, uh, fit Finley's a calf would not wrestle with knobs yeah. mm -hmm. from the calf, the meat of his calf, almost to the bone and back. Yeah. That mean, that, 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 that'd be like you cutting your hamstring in half. Right. Right. It was awful. That, they cut him oh. like a razor blade. And Fitz, such Terrible. a good guy and a tough guy. He didn't even sell it. He was a, you know, knobs. I'm hurt, and I took my shirt off, put it over it, called for medics right away. I didn't care about the, the end of the match or anything. And then the whole time, he didn't wasn't selling it at all. He was, he was wow. that's one tough. SOB. Right. I got to tell you one funny story. So Sandman comes in and they call him Hat. Right. So then I come back and then we got to be in Nitro and they put me right in that division because that's what me and Sad kind of started with these street fight shit. So anyway, yeah. we're, we're at Eric and then there was one of these, uh, you know, you put, carry milk in the plastic things with the, like the, the checkered X and oh, no, And I came by, oh. <laughs> off the second and whacked him in the head and I was really stiffing him a bunch of times. And then he went out in the locker room now after the match, and the match went good and everything. Uh -huh. But he got the LP out of him and came back in. He goes, No, what the F? Da, 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 da. You know, ba, 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 you know, in front of everybody. And I, my response was, uh, looked up at him and I said, And you're supposed to be the king of hardcore. <laughs> and everybody started laughing, and then he walked out of the locker room. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, oh, wow. when he wasn't there, I was in there for two years in that division, and right. I won the title for different times but every we were still going 200 some nights a year every night was a hardcore match it definitely screwed my body because we're going through right. tables no matter what you're getting hit with something that's not supposed to be you know whatever they had in the in the freaking back you know right. like i said and that's another thing like you said about if if you're gonna take a post i never put my hand up right i made you know you took i took the post in the head mm -hmm. if you're gonna get hit with a chair i never put my hand up you get as hard as that guy's going to hit you, take it full out on your head. Right. That's the kind of thing we were taught. That if you're going to do it, do it. Right. You know what I mean? Not Or if you get your head ran into the stairs, people go and they put their hand down, your head never hits it. Right. No, we weren't taught like that. You That's just why goes. It's 90, uh, I got more concussions than the there's teammates on the, uh, the Chicago Bears. Sure. No memory, but still got we got concussions out the you know what. Right. From the, but that's the way we were taught. Sure. Now you can't do none of that because of the concussion stuff going on. You know? Sure. But that's the part of the reality thing we were taught. Well, if you're you got to do it, make it look real. Like right. I told you, you know? back in the day, if you didn't wrestle, you didn't get paid. So right. You wanted to get paid, but, you know. But come on over tonight. We'll tell some good old stories. There you go. I was just going to say, we could talk all night yeah. about wrestling stories. I'm such a geek for wrestling, you know, my whole life. So yeah, well, We got them. Yeah. We around with the best, and we yeah, did a and lot of crazy our, stuff in the, our, the, our day. The, the uh, what you gonna call it, uh, questions, not bringing all those up. That, yeah. That, that every... Every you know, time we're interviewed. Yeah, like I told you before before ago. this we started recording here, I'm not gonna bring up any of that. This is this is just fun, you know, you, like you said, yeah. you talked it to death like Mick Foley talks about hell in the cell with Taker. He you know, you could yeah. just put it on a recorder and just say, Here, just take a listen to it, you know. Yeah. yeah so. But uh, it's it's good to come to back to where you began your roots and, and more at Fargo more is from one of them places. Right. This is where we you know, we actually got into business with Vern, sure. and these were one of the first places we ever wrestled or set up the ring or refereed or did anything. Right. And we first learned how to plug a car in. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell is up with that? Right. Jesus. Yeah. But, man, thanks for having us. We Absolutely. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, like... Uh, 
I don't often get a chance to talk to guys, you know, of your stature and have where you guys have been as a wrestling fan and as a guy who's gone through a lot of uh, serious medical stuff. Watching you guys on what team. What happened to you medically? Well, I have cystic fibrosis. And, really? Yep, and I've well, gone. Is that something that's the curvature of the spine thing? No, it's uh, it affects the lungs and the pancreas, and um, I've had uh, three organ transplants. Really? I had, had a double lung in 2002, a kidney back in 2017, and a pancre- pancreas this so past March. So cystic fibrosis attacks your organs. Yep. Yep. So. And how? In which way? Like. Uh, uh, you know, well, the, the lungs, uh, they get so filled with uh, mucus, and it gets hard in there, and you just you so get is it, is it a breathing thing? It uh, starts off as a breathing thing, but it also, breathing? yeah, and it also affects uh, the uh, pancreas. You have a hard time digesting things, and so that I had to get sucks. all that is there any, What's What are the... What are the uh, like help or cures it. Well, I've I've been very lucky. Um, I've sort of been riding the wave of the progress that cystic fibrosis has gone through. Um, when I was a kid, they said, well, I was adopted, and when I was brought to the family I was with now, they said, don't get too attached to them. Oh, because you were they were. I was I was that sick. Yeah, from. but then they found is medication. Is something to help. that still people get, or just like yeah, oh yeah, school? it's well right now about thirty thousand people in uh, North America have CF and. 30,000. 30,000 people, and a lot. the menial age is about 40. I'm 48. Does, does it so. sort of uh, get pushed to the wayside with all the other stuff, like all the cancers and I, I think so, and, since it's not as widespread as, yeah. like, say, cancer or some of the other ones. But uh, they've really come a long way, and I've seen, I've had friends who haven't made it. And um, What's the old thing well, with the lungs that Doc here, Holliday right? had about with the... Uh, I think that was, like, COPD or something, no, that, or pulmonary fibrosis. No, it was an old name for it. What is it called? Uh, TB. Yeah, tuberculosis. tuberculosis. Like yeah. that's that's sort of gone away, hasn't it? Right. That's still. A thing? I think that's that's gone away. Is, it, if is, I, I is believe what so. you have sort of doing that? Um, no, it's uh, it still affects quite a few people, and there isn't. Is it hereditary or yes. you catch it? It's is as long as uh, two parents are a carrier of that same CF gene. So it can be weaned out. Right. Okay. But uh, but right now there's there's no cure. There's a lot of treatments well, for listen, it. Well, listen. The next time we should bring attention to it. Like if if he does, Bob does. Something some uh, thing, events up here and stuff. Absolutely. We should do, like, you have yeah. you come out and do the proceeds to, to, you know, part of it to that for the benefit of you know, Absolutely. Found, get a foundation going. We're glad you're still around, too. Yeah, and, and like I said, by watching what you guys do and kind of a adapting some of the storylines that you guys have done and seeing some of the behind the scenes of how you guys deal with injuries and stuff, it made uh, my personal battle with CF good. You know, I didn't throw in the towel. You well, know. Well, it's hell getting older because I've been through a yeah. lot of stuff in the last yeah. three and, years. And exactly. you know, I've been up and down, and, and <laughs> this last time I was hurting pretty good here. So, yeah. you know, and you, you, you just can't do what you used to do. you got to right. slow down and everything and, and everything. Me, and me and Oz would donate you some organs. I'm sorry, but that <laughs> would be the end of you. Yeah, well, hopefully I'm done with <laughs> all the transplants. You don't want right. No. But uh, if you want to ever go to the, the Legends of Wrestling.com, Com. Yes. The Legends of Wrestling that com. That's my company. We go all over the place. We do a lot of stuff with Major League Baseball, NFL, and it's to bring all of us older wrestlers back together again. Sure. The Ric Flairs, the Bret Hart's, the Hacksaws, us, Jake the Snakes, the, the Animal for the Road Warriors. Mm-hmm. I mean, and we bring everybody together. We have a good time, and it's a good get together, and it's all friends getting together. It's like a reunion for us. Sure. So. Well, just know that you have an open mic here anytime you want to talk about any upcoming well, events. We might be coming back with Bob. Please do. Be we'll be, we'll be happy to have you. Is this cold weather up here, is it better because of it keeps down the bacteria and stuff? Um, is it worse I, I'd say the cold weather is probably better during the summertime when we get very humid. Does um, that make you sick? Uh, not now, uh, uh, but back when I was having all the lung problems, I was down to 17% lung capacity and man. when I got my transplant from my lungs. And, you know, just by watching you guys do it. How long did you have to wait for that? Two and a half years. But, and, it, and there's a chance you could, might not have got it. Right. I had a friend who... Well, we, were, we were talking about our buddy. There was a, just mm-hmm. a, 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 a... What is it? The 60, E60 or E30, 30 with ESPN on Matt Oh, Miller. oh yeah. yeah. Uh, he had a rare thing where his body makes too many, too much protein. Okay. And that is internal organs. He needed a heart. Okay. And he went to L.A. and weighed it. 
almost mm-hmm. a half a year, and he went to New Jersey and waited. He still lives in Eastern Pennsylvania, where we're from. Sure. But Christmas Eve, something happened, and it was like a Christmas miracle. Christmas yeah. Eve, called him. Somebody just, you know, passed away. We got a heart for you or something. Yeah. And he got a heart. Now he's up. He's, he's starting to comment better. He, yeah. he was going to die. Well, before I was down to about maybe 119, and now I'm up to 165. So and you look good. Yeah, look I'm feeling great and stuff. But you know, I just want to say, you guys, what you guys do. Well, there's help this new, there's like this me. new beer called <laughs> Pity City. Uh, no. Pit, ale. Pit stop. Pit stop. Pit stop ale. Right. Pale uh, ale. Pale ale. <laughs> You need to drink. It's a, it's healthy for you too. Sure. You, know, okay. you don't drink even get that a day, and you'll. I'll be only Jerry fun. Sags, my partner, partner wouldn't know the name of our own fucking beer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. All right, guys. Hey, thanks, man. You, you got your wrestling you. show. This has been the wrestling show with the Nasdaq boys. Thank you guys so much, and we'll probably see yeah, you yeah. tonight. Hey, let's do it, everybody awesome. tonight. Yeah. Hey, Bob, where are we going? Marriott and Moorhead. Marriott and Moorhead. We're yes. having a watching party. Smack, smack, smack down. Smack down. On see Fox. how we do. We're watching young guys. We're critique them. Talk to the people about it. You're coming over. Yep. Everybody be there. And let's tear it up. Look.